And we have a very special guest sitting on the line right now, and he is the voice of the Denver Nuggets. What's going on, Chris? Well, uh, hunkered down in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's a bit of a blizzard out here. We've got uh, 8 to 10 inches of new snow, so just hanging out today. Wow. Wow. You get to stay home with the family with a big snowstorm and stay away from the COVID-19. How is your family doing? How are you and your family doing right now? Family's doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, wife and dog are good here, and my two daughters are out in Los Angeles. They have jobs. They're working from home, and they're trying to stay safe, too. Awesome. Let's talk about Denver basketball. This is a great team, a great young team, one of the best young teams in the NBA. What are your thoughts with this team, with Jokic and Murray and even Porter Jr.? What do you think about this team? It's been a good season. If the season ended today, the Nuggets finished third in the West. They have played really well at some points. They've been disappointing at others. They're able to beat the better teams in the league. In fact, the best teams in the league, and yet they've lost to some of the sub-500 teams. So their record has been uneven. But uh, they certainly have the talent to make a, a deep run in the playoffs. You mentioned Paul Jokic having another terrific season. He's going to be the first team All-NBA center, I believe. Murray's been good. Gary Harris had a slow start, but uh, his last month has been really good. And they're trying to figure out a way to integrate Michael Porter Jr. into, into this very, very deep team. Porter was good, and he was coming on, and he was playing a lot, and then he sprained his ankle and he missed 10 games. And he had not been able to come back and get back into the lineup. But with this extended break, I think it's actually good for the Nuggets. They had some guys that were nicked up. And uh, when they come back, and I believe it's just going to be straight to the playoffs. I don't think there's going to be a lot of warm-up games and things like that. I think it's frozen now, and it looks like the Nuggets would match up against the Rockets in the first round. Chris, what is your thoughts about Paul Millsap being the leader of this team? I've been reading different stories over there in Denver that they say that Paul Millsap is one of the big leaders of this team. I think he's a five-time All-Star. This is a guy that has a very good NBA career. What are your thoughts about Paul Millsap being the leader of this team? You know, he's a quiet leader. Uh, he's a terrific player. One of the biggest two right players, for sure. I mean, he scores, he's a rebound, he's a good passer, and he's a terrific defensive player. A shot, he steals the ball, he can guard bigger men, he can guard guys on the wing after switches. But he, as I mentioned, is a quiet leader. He's not the vocal leader. You know, I, I hearken back the Nuggets maybe eight or nine years ago when they had Chauncey Billups. And Chauncey was the kind of leader you really want on the team. And the Nuggets have been kind of trying to develop that. A, a guy that is not only a starter, but is a guard who's who knows he's good. You even saw it on, on the horse game the other night in the NBA. He played Trey Young. He was down HOR and, and his confidence never wavered and he was able to come back to beat him. So I think if the Nuggets have a shortcoming in, in this day and age, it, it's just a lack of Chris Paul, uh, Chauncey Phillips type leadership. And I think if they're going to get to the next level, they've got to find that somewhere. Chris, from the veteran guy to the young guy, a lot of fans have been itching for Michael Porter Jr. to get more minutes. He's shooting 42% from three and almost 50% from the field this season. And a lot of fans have been complaining about him not getting more minutes, only 14 minutes a game right now. Do you think that has to do directly with the injury and only the injury? Or do you think there are other factors included in why he hasn't gotten as many minutes as people would have expected? You know, starting this season, we knew Porter was going to be a factor but we also knew that the Nuggets have one of the deepest teams in the league, and it's hard to come in with a team that got to the second round of the playoffs that has everybody back for him to break in. That being said, Michael Malone has been, well, let's just say judicious with the playing time for Porter. You know, Porter has shown flashes of brilliance. As I said, he's floated a couple of other nights. And, uh, you know, if you don't play defense or if you don't give it 110% on defense, Michael Malone tends to go with a guy like Torrey Craig or Will Barton at that wing position. So Porter was really coming on. He hit some fabulous games. And, and after a couple of those games, you just said, okay, now he's going to get 25 minutes a night. And then the next night, the Nuggets would play someone like the Houston Rockets where they needed a defensive presence. And Malone would go with Gary Harris or uh, – or Torrey Craig, and, and, and Porter might play 10 minutes. So his minutes inconsistent. When he's healthy, he's as talented as, 
he's still considered a rookie. He's talented as any rookie in the league. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when we come back from the extended break, how much playing time he's going to get. Jamal Murray is one of the best point guards in the NBA, very underrated. When people talk about Russell Westbrook and Harden and all the different point guards, the CP3, but nobody talks about Jamal Murray, maybe because he plays for Denver and Denver right now, even though they're a young team, they're a growing team. What are your thoughts of his leadership and his greatness on the court? Well, you hit the the nail on the head. He's young and growing. He's not an all-star point guard yet. He has all-star talent. He has all the physical makeup, and I think uh, mental makeup, too. He's tough. He's clutch. He just hasn't been consistent. You know, you watch Jamal Murray shoot in practice. You you watch him in certain games. You know, he comes up with 48 points against the Celtics and makes, you know, nine of 12 threes, and you say, why can't he play like this all the time? And I, I happen to think that sometimes it just takes a little bit more time to develop as a point guard in this league. I, w- I want to go back to Chauncey Billups who really wasn't a a top NBA player until his fifth year in the league. And I think Jamal, he's mostly been a shooting guard his entire career, and making the transition to point guard has been a challenge. When to pass, when to shoot, when to hit Nikola Jokic, which is all the time, by the way, and how to run the team. And so I think it's been a balancing act with him. He doesn't really have the great point guard mentality. You know, he's a fearless attack mentality scorer. But he's a pretty good point guard, too. But he's not great at either yet. And I think as the season goes along, as the as the year goes along, he's going to get there. But not quite there yet. He's averaging 18 a game, which is good. And he averaged almost five assists. And, uh, you know, he makes two more threes a game and gets a little bit more consistent. You'll see him in the running for all-star consideration. Chris, I want to shift now to your other sport, which is uh, volleyball. You were an Olympic gold medalist back in 1984. I want to shift to the Olympics because they're now moved for another year. Do you think this will affect certain sports, certain countries, and maybe older athletes that maybe they thought this year, 2020, would be their last Olympics? As a former Olympic athlete yourself, do you think this will have an effect? And if so, how much do you think it will affect these athletes? Well, the good news is that it's just a one-year delay. You know, I, I felt sorry for the for the athletes in 1980 that had trained three, four, five, six years, and then there wasn't another Olympics until 1984. So in the in the case of indoor volleyball back then, a lot of players had done their all to make that team and to get to Moscow, and then when they could go, that was the end of their careers. Now, you you take someone like Kerry Walsh Jennings, the most decorated female beach volleyball player volleyball player anywhere. She's 41 years old. This most likely will be her last go-round. She's in the process of trying to qualify for the Olympics. She has not qualified yet, and only two American teams will qualify. So one of them is in, and she is in a battle with another team for that second spot. And it's, it's very, very close. So how she reacts, you know, as an Olympic player, she's still in phenomenal shape. You know, she's been to five Olympics now, including one indoor She's got four medals. It's an incredible story, but now she's going to have to wait another year and, and then see if she can qualify. And, and if she doesn't, somehow she could win another gold medal. That would just be an unparalleled, uh, un, unparalleled feat. There's been a lot of tragedy throughout the world this year, but the biggest tragedy in the NBA was Kobe Bryant's death. I'm sure you have stories of Kobe Bryant. I'm sure you met Kobe Bryant. Do you have any good stories to tell about Kobe Bryant? You know, I knew Kobe. I Grew up with Kobe. You know, I lived in Los Angeles at the time. I was a huge fan of the Lakers, but I never met Kobe. Shaq, I know a little bit, but I never really got personal with Kobe. You know, Kobe wasn't exactly the hi, how are you type guy. (laughs) You know, he was all business all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people that know him obviously say as hard a worker as there ever was in the NBA. And, And you couple that with his talent. I remember we were coming on the air. We were the first, uh, the first game uh, after Kobe had passed away during the helicopter crash, and they were still trying to get confirmation. And it was just a surreal night. There have been two incredible nights that, that we'd be on, been on the air with the Nuggets. Uh, the, the first one with, with Kobe's death and the helicopter crash, and then, uh, you know, the, the COVID when, when uh, Rudy Gobert tested positive, you know, in right near halftime of our game, and then. Then it was said the NBA was going to suspend play. Our game was still going on. So uh, those two nights has really been uh, 
you know, it's been two two of the nights that I will never forget in my NBA announcing career. Uh, Kobe and the COVID, it's just uh, horrible circumstances. We're talking to the great Chris Marlowe. He is the voice of the Denver Nuggets. Chris, last question for me, just as referring to your broadcasting career. Do you have a call, a particular moment or a particular game that you broadcasted, whether it's with the Nuggets, whether it's with your uh, volleyball broadcasting career, Olympic broadcast career, or something else maybe that we don't know about? Is there one particular moment that stands out to you the most in your career? Oh, I, I've got a couple. I've got a couple. I'm going to give you the volleyball one first. In 2008, uh, Karch Karai and I are calling the women's gold medal final in Beijing. The United States team of Misty May and Kerry Walsh are taking on China, a China the hometown team. Driving rainstorm, and we're about five minutes to air. And Dick Ebersol, the executive producer uh, of the Olympics comes on the air and he says, uh, says, gang, uh, we've, we've had a great Olympics. This is the last event. Uh, we've, we've met our financial numbers. We, we, everything's been fabulous. We're going to air this match live, live. There will be no commercials live, live, as long as it goes. And I remember just thinking to myself, I can't remember any event <laughs> anywhere at any time where it was broadcast completely live with no commercials, no interruptions. And we did that 55 minutes, including a five-minute injury timeout for one of the Chinese players who was actually (laughs) faking it, where we stayed and covered that entire match. Of course, Kerry and Misty in the rainstorm, completely soaked. Uh, They win uh, their second Olympic gold medal together. I remember that. That was a night I'll never... Never forget that. The other one would be in, in 2008 uh, when the Nuggets were playing uh, in New Orleans in the uh, in the first round of the playoffs, and the Nuggets. So those are the two mo- moments I have for my broadcasting career uh, that were really special. I, I know there's others uh, along the way, but. Uh, uh, those two uh, really stand out. I will tell you this. I'm not a big Charles Barkley fan. One of the reasons why he has nothing good to say about the New York Knicks organization, but who does? Who does? <laughs> Anyways, well, before... my, only compl- Go ahead. my only complaint quickly with the national media is that they're, they're a little slow to recognize, you know, teams that are not in New York or in Chicago or mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. Uh, I think the Nuggets, uh, deserve a little more due. That being said, the Nuggets got to play better. They got to do some damage in the playoffs. And then Nikola Jokic and company will get uh, the recognition they deserve. Last question for me. You were just speaking about the Nuggets. Uh, The playoffs are right around the corner. If there is a playoffs, or if there is a regular, regular rest of the season, we don't know what's going on with the NBA. But if there is... Are the Nuggets one of the favorites to come out of the West because they're very young, very talented, and they have a very good bench? Do you think that this is one of the teams that could come out of the West and win the West? Well, it's going to be an interesting interesting road. I would not say the Nuggets are one of the favorites to come out of the West. Can they do damage in the West? Can they beat any team in the West? Yes, they have a tough draw. Right now, they've been matched up against the Houston Rockets, who the Nuggets have had... Uh, historical trouble with and most teams do guarding James Harden and now that Westbrook is back on the beam but the Nuggets beat him two out of four this year the Nuggets would have home court and I think the Nuggets uh, you know would have a good chance if they win that matchup uh, they could go on they beat the Lakers a couple times this year they beat the Clippers they have high-end potential thank God the Atlanta Hawks and the Sacramento Kings are not in the playoffs because then I'd be worried. But playing against high-caliber competition, the Nuggets have been good. And, you know, I'd give them a fighting chance. I'd give them a puncher's chance in the playoffs. And then maybe if everything broke right, uh, they could come out of the West. Chris, why don't you tell all the fans how they can reach you, how they can find you on social media? I'm at Chris Marlowe, C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-L-O-W-E. Glad to hear from Uh, any and all of your listeners. Awesome, awesome. Well, Chris, I would love to get you on the show again when the season does start to uh, build up again and there is a season. If there is, I would love to get you back on the show. Anytime. Uh, Great to be on. Just give me a call. Awesome. Thank you, Chris.